Hello everyone, this is Kat and welcome back to My Hero Academia Podfix. This will be the continuation of UA Survival Guide. This will be Part 46, Chapter 46. Tuesday morning, Izuku finds himself up in the apartment having breakfast with his guardians. He needed to sneak away after coming back from his morning run since it was about the time his classmates would be getting up and getting ready for the day, which usually meant everyone joining up for breakfast in the common area. Izuku is excited to see Hizashi humming away at the stove when he sneaks into the apartment, which Shota had texted him that it was unlocked. Hizashi swirls around when he spots the movement, and Izuku finds himself wrapped up in a tight hug before he even realizes the blonde-haired man had moved. Seriously, it's like Hizashi had teleported across the kitchen. Izuku melts into the tight embrace, doesn't mind that Hizashi is all but squeezing him. He'd missed Hizashi a lot. The apartment upstairs just wasn't as lively, and as cool as Nazu sensei was, a rodent just wasn't a good stand-in as an English teacher. Izuku had missed Hizashi in both a personal and an academic setting, and he knows Shota is always a little blah whenever his husband is gone too, so Izuku's glad he's back. Izuku's quite sure the underground hero had been living off of chili pouches and coffee solely, even if he'd made an effort to feed Izuku real food while he'd been recovering from quirk exhaustion. Everything can go back to normal. He'd missed normal. There was something about the tight hug, the squeeze of it, that makes Izuku think that Izashi might know about everything now. He doesn't doubt Shota would have not wasted a second before including Izashi in the secret, and Izuku doesn't know if that upsets him or fills him with ease. He supposes he's just glad that he didn't have to be the one to tell Izashi, and that the man has some time to let the information settle before Izuku sees him. He thinks, it's nice to know they both know, even if he is a little worried about it all. He doesn't know how that'll change things for him, between them, if... It even does it all. Izashi doesn't mention one for all, though, as he ushers Izuku into his chair and calls down the hall for Shota to join them. Only seconds later, the underground hero is joining them, flopping onto his own seat in front of a steaming mug of coffee. The fresh salmon smells heavenly, pan-seared, and served with miso soup and rice. This is nice as well. He usually just ends up having a quick meal with the rest of the class when they're all in a hurry to not be late for Shota's class. It's always nice to just sit upstairs with his guardians, and actually enjoy a meal. Especially a meal that Hizashi had made, because that's always good. Conversation flows easily, Hizashi telling them all about his time across the country and the villain that he helped take down. It was an organization a bit like the Shia Hisaikai, though, of course, there were no children being used to make quirk erasing bullets. Izuku hopes there are no children in the position that Eri had been anywhere else. When they'd finished eating, just before Izuku has to reintegrate himself with his classmates without raising questions of his absence, Izuku can just pout as Shota's palm flattens over his forehead without a word, to check for a fever, which is thankfully broken now. He's back to his regular temperature, and he's feeling completely fine, and if, by the way, Shota's brow relaxes slightly when he doesn't feel any heat this check, Izuku knows he'll be pushing him in classes again. Good. Izuku was starting to get sick of light training and showed insisting on quirkless training for the rest of the class just because Izuku wasn't fit to use his quirks. He really is thankful the man hadn't benched him entirely, even if he had kept a close eye on him. It was kind of him. But Izuku knows the rest of the class is going to be antsy to start back up with their own quirks again. Quirkless training had thrown everyone for a loop, even if it was a useful skill to have as a pro, especially with quirks like Erasure out there. Quirk exhaustion is not fun. Izuku decided on day three of his lingering fever that prevented him from training, so he is glad to be feeling better again, even if he is anxious to get back out there in training and start working with Black Whip. He knows he's going to be manifesting more quirks whenever the vestiges decide to force them onto him like they'd done with Black Whip. He needs to use every break in between manifestations to his full advantage and try to train the quirks before he gets overwhelmed by them. The sooner he starts getting a hold of Black Whip, the sooner he'll be ready for the next curveball. He doesn't want to be the kid with several different quirks that he can't control. It was bad enough when he'd been that kid with just one for all, and now again with Black Whip, which had very narrowly missed hurting people that he loves. Izuku slips out the door after their breakfast, with a ghost as a shadow in a full stomach, effortlessly joining up with the rush of Class 1A, slipping out the door as to not be late for homeroom class. He's so glad for everything to be back to normal. Classes return to usual after the fiasco that had been him manifesting a new quirk in the middle of an exercise. He's a bit surprised no one's upset with him after he'd almost hurt them. Everyone was more worried about him. He'd never thought he'd ever have friends like his classmates, and that thought makes his heart all warm and fuzzy. He'd started seeing Hound Dog again after a rather lengthy break between being kidnapped from the summer camp and all the effort and time he'd put into helping with the Shia Hasaikai raid and Eri. He simply hadn't had time to talk with the Pearl when he was already so busy with everything else going on around him. Izuku thinks he might have needed someone to be able to talk things through with. He's 
having still lingering thoughts about his mom. Being kidnapped, that raid and airy, but he's also glad that no one was forcing him to process faster than he was capable of. He thinks that he might have spiraled, if anyone insisted that he start seeing Hound Dog again. It feels different when Shota leads him down and they talk to Hound Dog about court counseling only. He knows he needs that. He really doesn't think that he could survive this alone, without a court counselor, but during that first session, Izuku can't help but miss being able to talk about other stuff. He'd steadily been letting things build up around him, as much as he tries not to, and he just... He feels safe in Hound Dog's office. The man is familiar, and kind, and honestly one of the first adults who'd managed to get Izuku to feel like this around them. Behind Aizawa Sensei and All Might, at least. And Hizashi, but that relationship had come a bit later. He knows Hound Dog is busy, though, his time is limited, and he'd already so graciously offered Izuku time slots in the morning back to him because of manifestations like this are serious and... Izuku's going to need counseling if he's going to get better than he had with One for All and even Blackwood. Izuku's relieved the adults around him are acknowledging how important these quirks are going to be, even if most don't have a full understanding and probably never will. It's nice that they're making him a priority when this could end up dangerous. He doesn't know what he's going to be getting from the vestiges, so he really needs to be ready. It had actually been Izuku who had asked Hound Dog if they could use half of one of those two sessions that he'd been offered for court counseling to instead do some regular counseling. He knows he needs to put a lot of time into quirk counseling, since he could very well, and totally going to be, manifest five more quirks. Five entirely different quirks. The pro had cocked his head at the request, and instead offered an additional half hour during each session that they could dedicate to regular counseling, which Izuku had gratefully taken him upon. And Izuku knew quirk counseling was serious, that he'd need the time being offered for exactly as it was being offered for, but he was also glad to have some time to wade his way through everything else that was going on around him. Izuku hadn't really liked the idea of seeing the guidance counselor at the beginning of the year when Shota had offered it, but he can't argue that he doesn't feel better not bottling everything up. Having someone to talk to who isn't a guardian, close friend, or a direct teacher is nice, and Hound Dog is really good at what he does. It's no doubt why he's employed at such a prestigious school. Shota and Hizashi had seemed so proud of him when he told them that he was going to be heading to counseling half an hour early for some additional help. Something warm had settled in his stomach at their prideful smile shot in his direction. Maybe it was the right decision to make. Following his visits to Hound Dog, Izuku and Shota had drawn up another quirk training plan, almost exactly the same as before, just a bit more intense in hopes of getting ahead of these manifestations in his near future. It's basically just the original plan. Morning training before classes on Monday and Friday, and an afternoon session on Wednesday afternoon. They also pick an afternoon training session on Saturday, which is followed by Izuku trailing up to the apartment for dinner with his guardians. Sometimes... Hitoshi joins them for those training sessions, too, which Izuku likes more than he'd care to admit. Izuku feels bad for... How much Shota is putting into all this, all these after-school sessions, not even to mention the ones that he's had with Hitoshi, too, but the man is always quick to assure that he'd rather do this than watch anyone get hurt. Izuku wishes there were more people in this world like Shota. Besides the schedule being a bit more grueling, in a good way, of course, nothing really changes... Sometimes Izashi joins them for quirk training, which is always awesome because Izuku knows Izashi has loads of good tips for controlling unruly quirks. Other times, Yagi-san is there with Shota, watching with a light smile as Izuku follows Shota's orders in training. Shota seems to work surprisingly well with Yagi-san, which Izuku honestly hadn't been expecting, and it's nice to not have to be worried about his guardian punching the other man after everything that had happened before Izuku ended up in 1A. He knows Shota hadn't been impressed at how Izuku had inherited one for all, but it's not Yagi-san's fault entirely. Izuku's the one who'd taken the proffered quirk, had hardly given it a thought before accepting what was being offered. It's nice having more people offering tips and help along the way. Yagi-san's a bit more involved now that he no longer has those embers of one for all left, and having Shota and Shizashi in his corner is a weight off his shoulders. It's also refreshing to see the three of them playing nicely when he's around. All three are such important parts of his life now, and he doesn't want them hating each other. Especially over him and one for all. And at the end of the day, no matter if his guardians and mentors don't exactly like each other, Izuku knows that he needs all the help he can get, and he thinks everyone involved is on the same page. It's a warm feeling to know that they can put things behind them for his sake. He doesn't want to cause any more problems between people he loves, like he had with his mother and dad, and even between himself and his mom. Mom and dad had never been able to get over things, but clearly showed to Hizashi and Yagi-san can. He can't imagine manifesting any more quirks without the help of his guardians and the retired number one hero. I can't believe you managed to catch Shota and Black Whip. Obro is snickering to himself as Izuku, Hitoshi, and the ghost himself walk up the stairs to the apartment. Izuku pouts. 
wasn't aiming for Shota. I was aiming for Hitoshi. We're talking about that, huh? Well, what can I say? Hitoshi grinned sharply. Your aim clearly sucks. Want to talk? Oboro snorts fondly. No way! Izuku shakes his head with a laugh. You just used your uncle as a human shield. Black Whip totally would have caught you if you hadn't hidden behind him. And my aim is getting so much better. You had, like, almost a year of practice with your capture weapon, and you still end up tied up in it. It took Shota seven years to master it, Itoshi whines, glaring daggers as the capture weapon had pulled around his neck as he walks. I still think it hates me. There's no other reason why it keeps tying me up. I swear I spent more time caught in it than anyone else, and it's supposed to be on my side. A piece of fabric can't hate you. Izuka chides as he pushes open the stairwell door for them to step through. Black Whip could hate me, though. My spine still hurts from where it launched me into a wall today. I was doing so well with it, too. Yeah, Itoshi winces. That was rough. I swear, I think I saw Shota's life flash before his eyes when you flew through the air. I'd never seen him so tense as he rushed to your side, man. Ouch. Obro nods in sympathy. You'd think your vestige friends would invite you back into the quirk and explain their quirks to you better, you know, if they're going to be handing them off. But sure, why not just throw you in head first and watch you sink? I'm swimming, jerk. Izuku scoffs. I'm lost again. Hitoshi sighs heavily, looking between Izuku and Obro's general direction. Sorry, Izuku offers a sheepish smile. It's not important, he's just being passive-aggressive again. Ah. Hitoshi nods like it's the most normal thing ever. Hitoshi knows that, more often than not, Obro was trailing along after Izuku. The purple-haired teen had just accepted the fact that Izuku was a package deal. A buy one, get one free, when the get one free just so happens to be a clinging ghost. It makes Izuku happier than it probably should to have a friend who accepts the ghost so easily. It's nice not having to watch everything he's saying, and... He does feel bad about how he'd been treating Obero after their fight in Recovery Girl's office just weeks ago. Izuku even likes to think that, after everything Obero and Hitoshi had done together while he'd been stuck with the League, that they'd gotten closer too, even if there was that barrier between them. You're so mean to me, Obero pouts. I wouldn't need to be passive-aggressive if they weren't stuck-up assholes who expect the world of you but give you nothing back in return. Like, seriously, they can't offer a heads-up, giving you riddles as if they're warnings and then going back on their word? Not ready, my ass. Izuku lulls an exasperated look in Obro's direction. The ghost pouts and turns more theatric. Fine. I'll let it go for now. I still don't like him, though. If I ever meet them, we're gonna throw hands. Favorite ghost versus seven jerky liar ghosts. 1v7, come at me, cowards. You never have, and your odds on that fight are impossibly low, just so you know. Izuku reminds as he pauses outside the apartment door. Hands on the doorknob, and Izuku glances over to a pouting, confused Hitoshi. Sorry again, he's all heated up. Hitoshi shrugs as the pout returns to Hitoshi's usual plain expression. As long as he doesn't want to fight me, I'm good. Confused, definitely, but good. I would love to fight you. Izuku bites back a smile. He doesn't. Bad translation, Obro accuses dramatically as he crosses his arms over his chest in a huff. You never let me have any fun. Of course I meant a friendly fight. Like when I used to lay his uncle out flat during class. Friendly. Mizuku waves him off with a laugh, finally turning the doorknob and pushing the door open. He and Hitoshi slip out of their shoes as Obro makes his way into the kitchen where Izuku hears voices. I just don't know if we should tell him. That's his Ashi's voice, Izuku hears, a low whisper. He sounds a little worried. Does he need to know? I'd want to know if someone who kidnapped me was arrested. Shota's light voice replies. It came from Tsukuji himself. I also think he'd like to know. Yagi seemed relieved. Maybe he will, too. Gran Torino was involved as well. You know that he was worried about that dinosaur of a pro when he wasn't a part of the raid. Izuku and Hitoshi share a look as they trail quietly into the kitchen. Shota Nazashi obviously hadn't heard the door open and shut, or heard the teenager slumping around in the Genkin. Tell who what? Someone was arrested. Hitoshi pipes in as soon as they're stood shoulder to shoulder in the doorway, like children peering in to ask if dinner is ready yet. Both men startle whipping around to face the doorway. Hitoshi snickers. Where's your situational awareness, huh? Oh, great master of awareness, Eraserhead. I shouldn't need to be aware of the brat sneaking around in my own home. Shota scowls, eyes narrowing pointedly on Hitoshi. You just lost dinner privileges, brat. No, he has not, Izashi scoffs, swatting lightly at Shota's shoulder. What if I told you about threatening people when you're embarrassed, huh? They're allowed to be here. We're literally expecting them, teenage sass and all. Now, how much did you listeners hear? N not much, Izuku promises, looking away guiltily. We, um, didn't mean to eavesdrop or anything, just we heard that someone was arrested and, and you mentioned my internship mentor. Is he okay? 
Yeah, he's okay. Shota slumps in his chair. We're just hearing about it, but it happened about the time of the Shia Hisaikai raid. I got the call on my way up here. A member of the League had been taken into custody. We thought that you might like to know. That portal villain. They're still looking into him. In the process of getting DNA testing and finding his identity still, they actually didn't say much, but he's been arrested, and Tsukuji thought that it might give you some peace of mind after everything. Kuragiri? Izuku blinks in surprise. Shota and Hizashi blink in contained surprise at Izuku knowing the villain's name. He remembers Kuragiri introducing himself at the USJ, and again when he'd been kidnapped, but he supposes it's still strange to know it so well. When you think of the League, you think of Shigaraki, not his henchmen. Who? Hitoshi cocks an eyebrow glancing between Izuku, Shota, and Hizashi. Oh, um, Izuku bites his lip. Kuragiri, I... I don't know his name, his real name, I mean. That's just what he introduced himself as when I was kidnapped. He was... Shigaraki's handler, I think. So, so that's, um, good, but also bad, I think? Good and bad? Izashi turns from the stove, eyebrows furred in confusion. What do you mean, listener? You don't think it's good? Um, well, Izuku bites at his lip, shifting nervously. Good that he was arrested, I suppose. I'm glad that he's off the streets and not a threat to us anymore. Shigaraki doesn't have his main mode of transportation either now, but, um, he really was a handler of sorts. From what I could see, he kept Shigaraki in line and, and took care of him, like he, uh, was weirdly devoted to Shigaraki. So, you think Shigaraki could go off the hinges without his handler? Shota asked slowly. Izuku gives a sheep a shrug. I mean, I don't know, but it's a possibility. His sensei was already arrested, and now, now Kurigiri too. Shigaraki already isn't, well, all there, so... Well, shit. Shota sighs, dry-washing his face and his palms. I never really considered that, and I doubt that Tsukuchi has either. We could not arrest him. He's a threat, and Shigaraki having use of his quirk is a dangerous thing, but... Yeah, fuck. We should be prepared for something like that. Thanks for the heads up, kiddo. Izuku nods more to himself than anyone else. Was Kurigiri... Izuku bites hard at his lip. Was he hurt? Is... is he okay? Why are you wondering about a villain? Hitoshi is the first to ask the question that obviously is on everyone's mind, whipping around to face Izuku. Does it matter? He kidnapped you, Obro adds, brow furrowed. I know you have this whole nice guy thing going on, but that man tried to kill your class. He stole you from a summer camp and held you hostage for three days. He's a bad guy. He doesn't deserve your sympathy. Shoda and Izashi say nothing, just looking between the teens. I know. Izuku went to speaking to both his friends. Just... He was the only one who was kind to me when I was, um, when Shigaraki had me. I don't know, but there was just something different about Kurigiri. He gave me water and, and pain medication, and I don't know if I would have survived, sits on the tip of his tongue, but Hizuku wisely doesn't mutter the word aloud. Shoda and Hizashi's faces are pinched, like they're finishing the sentence on their own, and it physically pains them to think of any different outcome to him and Kachan getting rescued. Dobro's frown is so deep it's upsetting to see on the usually bright and grinning face. Hitoshi sports his own small frown, looking between everyone in confusion, not entirely on the same page. Izuku forces out a breath, bowing his head. He helped me, and I don't even think Shigaraki knew. I know he's a villain, but he wasn't awful to me, and... I don't know, he just wasn't like the rest in the League. There was something off about him. What was off about him? Shota asked calmly as Izuku and Hitoshi finally make their way to the kitchen, each settling at the table with Shota. Izuku doesn't know how to really explain it, so he simply shrugs and keeps quiet. He can't put it into words. He knows Kurigiri is bad, and that he works with Shigaraki. He knows the man is blindly loyal to Shigaraki, but Hana's words linger in the back of his head. He gave him Kurigiri. He remembers the ghost child saying that about all for one. I don't know where Sensei found him, or what they did to him. Izuku swallows hard at the words fluttering around in his head. That's really all he remembers of that conversation, just those two things. It's not a lot, but it puts things into perspective, all perspective Izuku can't tell anyone about. It's one thing to walk out of being kidnapped with some information. It's another entirely to claim a villain is there against their will, which is stupid because Kurigiri is clearly loyal. It just sounds stupid. Still, Izuku can't help but think. You really want to know about him, Sunshine? Hizashi's the one to break the silence, and Izuku whips his head up and nods slowly, trying not to frown at Hizashi's uncertain look. He's a Tartarus. As far as Shota heard, he's fine, but I... know he was good to you for a little bit there, but he deserves to be where he is. He's safe there, and he can't hurt anyone else. Izuku nods thoughtfully. That makes sense. 
Okay, there's a good breeze out. Sorry, I just... No apologies. Shota cuts him off. No one experienced what you did. Maybe... Maybe he helped you, but he's still one of the people who took you away in the first place. You're allowed to regard him however you'd like, and we can't change that. We have no right to try and change your own personal views. He wasn't kind to us, but he was to you. But he's a villain. Hitoshi wrinkles his nose in offense. Yes? Hizashi agrees quietly, turning back to the stove and stirring what smells to be curry. But he wasn't cruel to Izuku. Until we're in the same position, which I hope that none of us ever end up in, we have no right to tell Izuku how to feel about this. There's nothing wrong with wanting to know the well-being of someone who is kind to you, even if they're villains. Hizashi pauses, and then, looking at Izuku, he adds on an afterthought. Empathy is a good trait for a hero to have, Sunshine. You have a very kind heart, and I'm glad that hasn't changed after everything. Izuku bows his head in a nod, heart still hammering in his chest. Yeah, Hitoshi frowns. All right. Why? Ogro starts slowly, pausing for a second before clearing his throat. Why do I feel like there's more you haven't told me? What else happened when you were with the League? Izuku shakes his head lightly in acknowledgement, but doesn't speak. Let's just... Shota shakes his head, attention lulling between everyone before settling on Izuku. Let's put this aside for now. We can talk more when we know more about the villain. We all just thought you might like to know that more of the people who hurt you were arrested. Okay, I can do that, Izuku nods quickly. I do appreciate it. I'm I'm glad he's away from the League, and that Shigaraki doesn't have Kurigiri's quirk at his disposal anymore. Might make fighting him a bit easier when the time comes, huh? Neither of his guardians so much as crack a smile at the poor attempted humor. Maybe it would have had the desired effect if they didn't know Izuku possessed the only quirk that stood a match for all for one, and his rising army. Izuku almost feels bad about bringing it up. Why does it feel like I'm missing something? Again? Hitoshi groans, glancing around the room. Time carries on. Izuku doesn't hear much more about Kurigiri or the League. He doesn't know if things are actually calm, or if his guardians and heroes just aren't telling him. Izuku knows if it was serious, Yagi-san would tell him to be ready, or even Obero, who Izuku knows eavesdrops a lot, would warn him that something was going down. And Shota and Izashi know his place in all this, too, even if neither really likes the fact. He doesn't think that they'd withhold information from him if he truly needed it. He knows he has a place in all this, and he'd known that when he accepted All Might's quirk. Izuku pretends the lack of information doesn't bother him, and he goes about his business. He trains hard, and he tries his absolute best in his classes. He works with Itoshi and his classmates and prepares for the upcoming second round of internships with everyone else. He keeps up with his sessions with Hound Dog, and even manages to find the time to visit Airy between everything else going on. Soon, November is approaching, and with November comes Shota's birthday. It's the first birthday since he started staying with his guardians that he finds out about in advance, though nothing more than Hisashi pleading that the man take the evening off from patrol so they can celebrate it together. It's your birthday, Izuku blinks in surprise, only half aware of how his guardian had jolted in surprise once again. Izuku doesn't think they should be, after all, he'd slept up in the apartment with them last night, so they knew he was around, and it's about the time that he wakes up. We need to get you a bell or something, Shota grumbles playfully under his breath. Don't worry about a problem, child. It's nothing. Izashi's just being annoying again. Beg to differ, Izashi scowls. Let us celebrate you. You do so much, and people appreciate you. People want to celebrate your birthday. I swear, if you work on another one of your birthdays, I'm going to... to... Going to what, Izashi? Shota draws teasingly, turning to face his husband with a playful grin, like he knows Izashi has no leg to stand on with this particular argument, like they've had it before. What are you going to do if I work another birthday? You're insufferable, Hisashi rolls his eyes, slumping in his chair. I'll stop touching you. Izuka stills, awkwardly shuffling his feet as he processes that. What does that even mean? He doesn't even really want to know. Whoa-ho, Obero snickers from the counter. Young ears in the room, Hisashi. Keep it in your pants, or keep it out of Shota's pants. That's worse. Obero just made it worse. How does he always make it worse? Izuka feels the flush crawling up his cheeks, and he has half a mind to hide his face in his hands. Izashi. Shota scowls, a faint blush dusting his cheeks as he scowls. The kid is right there. Should I, uh, go back to my room or something? Izuku asks, pushing down the urge to do just that and leave his guardians to argue whatever this is. Is this a private conversation? What? Izashi frowns, glancing between Izuku and Shota before his eyes widen and he chokes on nothing. 
No, no, that's not what I, I, I didn't mean that. Well, I mean, yeah, that too, I guess. Intimacy is touching too, but I was talking about massages. Like how you like it when I rub your ankles and stuff, you pervert. You'll be getting no head scratches or back rubs or anything from me if you're going to be a sour old man about letting people celebrate you. You're older than me, showed her minds dryly. If anyone's an old man, it's you. That really didn't make it much better. Obro offers, glancing back at Rizuku, and the ghost snickers when he finds the teenager's cheeks lit up in a fierce blush. Not the best at thinking before speaking, are Hizashi. Gotta love the idiot. The blush on Shota's face, though. Perfection. Izuku appreciates the way Shota's trying to ease them out of the awkwardness by redirecting the attention to something else. He really does not want to think about any sort of intimacy between his guardians. Nope. No thank you. Why do I even love you? Hizashi groans, slumping down into his arms, crossed on the tabletop. They have this fight every year, if you can believe it. Obero tells Izuku as if noticing the teenager's gaze dancing between his two guardians. He never wants to celebrate, but Hizashi shows his love through celebrating and gift-giving, even back when we were kids. Yua forced Sho to pick where he wanted to go for his birthday that year when we went to that cat cafe, and Zashi struggled to plan anything ever since. I mean, all they did last year, at Shota's insistence, to not celebrate at all, was to have cake. Hizashi was sour for weeks afterwards. This is one of the few things their personalities actually clash over. Izuku takes a second to mull that over before turning wide-eyed onto the dark-haired man. You don't like your birthday? It's not that I don't like it. Shota shakes his head, attention lulling toward Izuku entirely. I have nothing against my birthday. I just don't want to make it a big deal. I have everything I need, and it's just another year, right? Celebrating my birthday was just never something I liked to do, even as a kid. It's too much fuss. I'd just rather do something quiet with you two and the cats. Hizashi opens his mouth to interject, but Izuku beats him to it. Why, um... Izuku glances away anxiously, aware of both guardians looking at him now. Why don't we do something small, then? I... I want to celebrate your birthday with you. Like... like you guys did for me, if... I mean... You don't have to, of course. It's your birthday, and I... I think you should decide how you want to spend it, but I'd... I would like to celebrate it with you, Shota. You've both done so much for me, and I... I appreciate you both so much. There's a moment of silence, and then... What do you have in mind, kid? Izuka jolts in surprise. Oh, um, I was just thinking maybe we could go to that cat cafe again. You seemed to like it a lot when we went for my birthday, and I know you guys can't always find the time to get off campus much anymore. I just thought it might be fun to get out for a while, but go somewhere quiet that we all liked. Shota mulls over it again before sighing. I don't want to go to the arcade again, just the cafe. Done! Izashi chirps quickly before Shota even has a chance to go back on his decision. Cat cafe it is. Yes, out of boy sunshine. You managed to talk our grumpy cat here into something I never can. Oh, this'll be so much fun. We can bring the boys out and have those delicious hot chocolates again. And they have that dark chocolate cake that you love, sweetheart. I'll still make you a cake, of course, if you can never have too much cake, you dig? It'll be perfect. You're way too into this, Shota chides tiredly. I'm excited, Hizashi laughs openly. You never say yes, especially not so easily. We've had this argument for hours some years. Our little sunshine's a miracle worker. You know, Obero grins teasingly. Izashi also suggested the cat cafe like 20 minutes ago and Shota said no. He really is weak for you. He's so sickeningly wrapped around your little finger and I always thought Izashi had him whipped. Ask him for a pony next. I want to see what he says. Izuka shakes his head, shooting the ghost an annoyed look. A little closer to Shota's birthday, Yua comes by the school to break Hitoshi out for a couple of hours. Izashi, who is with the two boys when Yua signs Hitoshi out, approves for Izuka to tag along with them and signs him out as well. It's only after they're in the car and Izuka realizes they're going out to buy Shota gifts. He might seem hard to buy for, Yua tells Izuku as they walk into a store together. But he's really a big softy. He'll like anything you pick for him, Izuku-kun. I mean, one year Hitoshi wrapped up a rock that he'd found in the garden. He couldn't have been older than three, and I kid you not, Shota kept it for years. Wait. Hitoshi frowns as if this is news to him. Is that why they had a rock on their coffee table for, like, my entire childhood? I don't remember giving a rock. I always thought they were just weird dudes. Izuka can't help but laugh. Really? Oh, yeah. Yua smiles softly. I'm sure he'd treasure anything from either of you. He is a soft spot, and if all else fails, find him something with a cat on it. I'm getting him a tie I saw online. It's got a cat face on the end of it. He'll love it. He will love that, Hitoshi agrees thoughtlessly. I don't know what I'm going to get him yet. Maybe a rock again. He liked it the first time. You're not cute enough to pull that off anymore, Yua snorts out. Rude. Hitoshi pounces. He turns back to glance over the clothing section of the store and therein, as if 
Something I'll draw on his attention. Coming from my own mother, Bud noted. I'll find something else, I guess. Hitoshi huffs out the I guess playfully before turning to browse the clothing again. I wonder if they have any hoodies with cats on them. He'd love that. Maybe I'll grab the weirdo some salty licorice that makes him happy. I'm going to go look around, Izuku tells Hitoshi's mother. I want to find something for him, too. All right, sweetheart. You and Nod's looking up from where she's searching through hangers of ties. Don't leave the store, okay? Shota will kill me if anything happened to you under my watch. The store has a little bit of everything. Izuku's alone. Obro had come with him to the store, claiming he needed to get off campus for a while, as if he doesn't follow Shota and Hisashi around their patrols almost every day of the week. The ghost had wandered off within a couple of minutes of the group walking into the store, so Izuku decides to pick out a gift for Shota before finding his ghost. Izuku really has no idea what to get for Shota. He's known the man the least amount of time anyone here, and Izuku likes to think that he knows his guardians pretty well, but at the same time he also doesn't. He knows basics. Shota likes to sleep whenever he can. He loves cats and coffee and a sleeping bag. He loves his family, hoodies, and the color pink, but that's not really a lot to go off of. Especially not when Hitoshi and you are already focused on cat things and clothing items. Izuku knows Shota's selective about what kind of pink he adds to his wardrobe. Just a pair of pink sweatpants and a pink t-shirt Izuku had seen him only wear twice. He knows Shota is particular about his coffee, and he loves his sleeping bag in particular, not sleeping bags in general. Doesn't really give him a lot to work with. Izuku browses the aisles, gaze flicking over everything that there is to be seen, but nothing clicks. Nothing he sees screams Shota or makes Izuku think of the man in the slightest. He can't imagine Shota loving anything he finds, and he wants to find Shota something that he'll like. He can't see Shota using anything that he picks up to examine briefly, and he doesn't want to get him something surface level of a gift that Shota will appreciate for the sake of it coming from Izuku, but will never use or really think about again. Izuku wants to find something perfect. Shota's done so much for him, in class and in his personal life. He loved Shota and Hisashi dearly, but Shota had been the first one in his corner, the first to listen to him and find solutions to his problems, the first to offer aid when Izuku had needed someone, all those months ago after being evicted from his home. Izuku wants the man to know how much he appreciates him. He gets more and more frustrated with each aisle that he passes through. He can faintly hear Hitoshi and Yua arguing about who gets to give the man a pair of socks with cats on it, but doesn't really give it much mind. He knows Shota will love the socks, even without seeing what they're talking about. He doesn't find Obero until he makes his way to the last section of the store, the toy aisle. Izuku hadn't originally planned on coming this far. He's not going to find anything for his guardian in the toy aisle, but he hadn't spotted Obero anywhere else, and this is the last spot in the store. He knows the ghost wouldn't have left without saying anything. Obero, Izuku calls out softly when he sees a head of pale blue hair standing in place, just staring into a bin of stuffed toys. What? It's perfect. The ghost breathes out, turning to look at Izuku. You've got to get it for him. He'll love it. He'll adore it. Please, I know my best friend, and I know he'll... He'll really love it, Izuku. Izuku steps closer, peering into the bin with the ghost. It's not hard to tell what the ghost is talking about, and as soon as Izuku spots it, warmth fills his stomach. Obro is right. It's perfect. It's so perfect for Shota. Yeah, Izuku picks up the toy. You're right. Shota's birthday falls on a Wednesday. Izuku spends his time looking at the gift box perched on his dresser. Leading up to the man's birthday, he's not having second thoughts about what he had picked out, but he is anxious about giving a gift. It's the first gift that he's given in a long time, just because he didn't have anyone to give gifts to, or even had the time to pick something out for anyone. He's worried Shota might not like it, and he's worried it'll be weird. Everyone's told him Shota will like anything he gets, but what if they're wrong and he hates it? It's in... Out of the box sort of gift, not exactly something anyone else would pick out for Shota, but Izuku couldn't imagine giving his guardian anything else, and he knows it's coming from both him and Obero, so even if Izuku is nervous to give the gift, he knows he will anyways, because it's from Obero as well, even if Shota will never know that. Izuku left that morning with his thoughts still on the blue box with the pink ribbons, entirely Obero's choosing. Classes are the same as usual, no one but him and Hitoshi and possibly Ida, knowing that it's Shota's birthday. None of them say anything about it, respecting the man's privacy. Izuku knows if Shota had put up much of a fight about even acknowledging his birthday, he won't want 20 high school students bombarding him with happy birthday wishes. Shota isn't even any different during classes, in fact. He might be a little harder on them during heroics training. Izuku just smiles to himself as the man barks out directions and criticism. When classes are finished and everyone is returning to the dorms, Izuku and Hitoshi sneak away to their rooms to change out of their gym uniforms and to grab their gifts. Hizashi had rented a table at the cafe for two hours, just after dinner time, so the plan was to stop somewhere for dinner and then head to the cafe for cat cuddles and dessert. Izuku's excited. 
He meets Satoshi in the hallway, each holding their gifts for the man. Izuka clutches at his box, aware of the ghost lingering close behind them as they trek up the stairs to the apartment to meet up with Shota and Hisashi so everyone can leave together. He knows Shota is going to be exasperated with both of them. He'd explicitly told them not to get him anything, but Izuka knows no one had heeded them warning. It was so silly of Shota to even try and talk them out of it. The man's eyes narrow on the gifts in their hands when he spots them sneaking into the apartment and rolls his eyes fondly. He doesn't say anything, though, so Izuka takes it as a win. Dinner is a quiet affair. It's just Shota, Hisashi, Hizuku, Hitoshi, and Namuri, who claims she's bored without Eri at home. Apparently Togeda and the other third years are showing Eri her first movie night, which is conveniently on the night that they're going out for Shota's birthday. Izuku just knows the woman had planned this, to be able to come to Shota's birthday without overwhelming Eri with too many cats at once. Namuri bats her eyelashes and pouts at Shota until he caves and agrees that she can come with them. Hisashi had conveniently booked a table for five instead of four. Izuku snickers to himself at the slightly miffed look Shota shoots back at the blonde, who is looking anywhere but at his husband as they leave campus as a group. They arrive at the cafe perfectly on time for their reservation, and Izuku's glad to see all the cats he'd met the first time still milling around at different tables and cuddling up to their patrons. Shota and Hisashi splurge on cat treats, ordering these before anyone even had a chance to glance at the menu. Instantly, cats flock to their table. Despite not smiling, Shota looks incredibly happy and content surrounded by his company and the cats. Izuku likes seeing his guardian so happy. Everyone's having a good time. Izuku's cat friend from the last time his back snuggled into his lap and Shota had a gray kitten who is a new addition to the cafe, playing around in his hair and patting along his shoulders. The baby paws at Shota's face and bats at stray hairs and Shota doesn't even seem to mind. Hitoshi is catless, frowning dramatically as he watches Shota in jealousy, and Hisashi's watching Shota too, just with such fondness at seeing his husband so content on his birthday. Izuku doubts it's a look on Shota that Hisashi gets to see very often. Namuri's chatting kindly with one of the baristas who just delivered another coffee to the table for Shota, waving a feather toy around thoughtlessly, unaware of two cats stalking the toy, ready to pounce on her and the feather toy. Izuku's waiting for that to happen, and Obero... Obero looks to be having the most fun. He sat by the window, being stared at by three cats. He wiggles his fingers and calls out the cats' names, and Izuku wonders how much time the ghost spends here when there's nothing else to be doing. He doesn't know why he's never asked the ghost what he used to do in his spare time when both Shota and Hizashi weren't doing anything exciting enough for the ghost to tag along for. The more he thinks about it, the more he can imagine the ghost hanging around here. Cats can obviously see him, so for a lonely ghost, that's probably a blessing. The thought makes Izuka's heart hurt. The cats don't seem surprised by the ghost's presence, which makes Izuka believe that they're probably familiar with the ghost, and a few even try to rub up against him, but go right through. They don't seem phased, and just move on to the next person offering treats or waving a cat toy around. A small white cat, in particular, sits at his side, just gazing up at him. If Izuku strains his ears, he thinks he can almost hear the cat purring. He doesn't remember seeing such a cat when they'd come here for his birthday, but the cat does look quite old, so maybe he's not a regular around here much anymore. I wish Nemo liked me like this. Obero whines, hand hovering over the cat's head as if he's going to pet it. The cat tries to arch into the petting, but goes right through, obviously. The cat doesn't seem phased, tail swishing lightly behind it. At least fish and blanket don't hate me. Obro grins fondly, despite the glint of disappointment in his gaze at not being able to pet the cat. His eyes flick up to Izuku and he smiles softly when they make eye contact. This one's name is Cloud. Fitting, isn't it? He's an old man now, but when I met him, he was just a baby. He was around that day when we came here for Shota's birthday, the first time. I don't know if they remember him, but I do. We bonded. Izuka looks away sharply, petting the cat in his lap as a distraction. The cat makes a purr sort of noise at being disturbed from its sleep in his lap. When he glances back, Obero is cooing at the feline, and Cloud is making noises back in acknowledgement. Izuka wishes it was that easy for him to interact with ghosts. No one thinks anything of a cat watching nothing or making noises at nothing. But when he does it, it's considered weird. Latin smiles softly to himself as his fingers tossle through the soft fur. They all order a slice of cake, despite the chocolate birthday cake they all have waiting for it, them at home, and Izuku orders a slice of mata roll cake at Obro's insistence, and the ghost hovers over his shoulder and stare down at the slice. This is torture. The ghost groans as everyone digs into their cake. I know I won't even be able to taste it. If I did eat it, ghost discrimination. Izuku snorts a laugh into his bite of cake, almost choking on it. He shoots a fleeting glare over his shoulder before taking another bite, before anyone can even mention it. When everyone's finished eating, they're almost out of time in the cafe, as you can mourn the fact that he'll need to wake up the kitty in his lap soon, who'd been peacefully sleeping on him nearly the entire two hours. The white cat cloud had 
graced the table with his presence after Obro has joined them and was now currently sat on a smug looking Hitoshi's lap. Hizashi insists that Shota opens his presents in the cafe. Hizashi had gotten Shota a new golden chain for his wedding ring to go onto when he couldn't wear it on his finger, and a new leather satchel. Shota seems happy enough after telling Hizashi off for spending so much money on the quality gifts. He remembers Hizashi doing the same thing to Shota on his own birthday, so this must be a familiar dance for the two of them. Hizashi gets a thankful kiss on the cheek from Shota, which is about as much PDA as Suku thinks that he'd ever seen from Shota, and the blonde looks ecstatic at it. Shota opens Namuri's gift next, carefully tearing the paper with a suspicious look. Izuku doesn't see what the gift is, since the man hides it under the table before Izuku can peer over. Hizashi glances down between his husband and the table before letting out a full belly laugh. Izuku and Hitoshi share a look as Oboro peers over the back of Shota's chair curiously before he lets out a prompt laugh as well. Best not inquire about this one, Zuku. The ghost offers teasingly, and Izuku knows then that he doesn't want to know what the R rated hero would have gotten for her school friend's birthday. I hope you kept the receipt for this. Shota huffs out, slipping whatever he just opened into the satchel, still partially wrapped. You're welcome, the woman teases back as she holds out another wrapped gift. Shota glares at it, untrustingly. Easy, tiger, Namuri snickers, waving the gift temptingly. This one's for Mary, not me. You're safe. She picked it out all by herself. Even made you a little card, too, that cutie. Mary's present for the man is a package of two headbands, one with thin wire cat ears and the other with a tiny little unicorn horn fabric ears, and a flower crown decorating the top. It's quite clear it was definitely picked out by a little girl. Wow. Aries got style. Hitoshi snorts out, one eyebrow cocked as his eyes narrow on the unicorn headband. If anyone can pull that off, it's definitely you, Uncle Show. Don't nettle people on their birthday. The underground hero sighs in defeat. I think they're cute, Hisashi laughs. The cat headband is so you, sweetheart. It'll be perfect when you're marking and your hair gets in the way, you dig? The other one, though... I don't know if it really suits you. Kind of clashes with the all-black attire that you got going on. Put one on, Namuri prompts with a wide grin, pulling her phone out and aiming the camera at Shota. Come on, I promised little Larry I'd get a picture of you wearing the present that she picked out. You don't want to hurt that poor darling girl's feelings, do you? Not happening, Shota scoffs. I'll wear the unicorn one, Izuka volunteers with a light smile. I think the flower crowns are pretty. We can take a picture together for Eri-chan. Then you don't have to do it alone, right? Shota's nose scrunches up in defeat. Fine. He sighs deeply, slipping the cat ears onto his head with a sour expression. One picture, just for Eri. Get over here, problem child. Izuka laughs as he moves to stand beside Shota, leaning on the back of the man's chair as he slips the headband on. He doesn't know what he looks like, if it's okay, but Obro tells him they look adorable, and Izuka can hear Hisashi cooing slightly. Namuri holds her phone up, shooting them a shit-eating grin that widens as soon as the flash goes off. Eri didn't ask for a photo, did she? Hitoshi snickers into his hand. Nope. Namuri grins, popping the pee as she laughs. But I'll certainly cherish this picture, and I'm sure she'll like it too. I'm thinking about framing it, actually. My dear, dear Shota, and one of my cutie pie nephews. This is also totally blackmail material. Oh, Hizashi smiles lightly, leaning into Namuri's face to see the picture that she'd taken. Send me a copy of it too. They're my boys, after all. We can put it up in the living room, eh, Shota? We have so few pictures of our sunshine. I don't like any of you. Shota sighs heavily, though his lips do twitch up faintly in a smile. All right, what's left to open? Let's get this over with so I can take what's left of my dignity and go home. He opens Satoshi's gift next, the sweatshirt that Hitoshi had picked out and a couple packages of salty licorice as well, as the gift from Yua and Hitoshi's father. Shota snickers at the tie and socks and stares fondly at a hoodie that Izuku only now realizes is completely black with... Tiny, triangle cat ears sewn into either side of the hood. When it comes to Izuku's turn, the teen hesitates. Anxiety swirls in his chest as he clutches the box to his chest. Um, Izuku swallows roughly, taking comfort in Obro leaning on the back of his chair as he finally hands the box over to Shota. I wasn't sure what to get you, so I, um, I hope you like it. You didn't have to get me anything, Shota reminds softly. But I appreciate it, kiddo. Thank you. Open it, Obro prompts, going unheard as usual. The ghost is bouncing on the balls of his feet like an overexcited toddler. Can't wait to see the look on his face. He's going to love it. Shota carefully pulls one end of the ribbon, and the neat bow comes undone. He doesn't bother waiting as he tugs the lid off and stares down in the box for a long second. He doesn't say anything, and Izuka's heart sinks into his stomach. Gently, Shota reaches into the box and tugs out the stuffed cat that Izuka and Obro had found. Izuka knows it's impossibly soft to the touch, and 
Just your average size plush toy, not too big, not too small. That's not what had drawn Izuku's attention to it, though. Hizashi inhales a surprise through his nose, and even Namuri makes a breathless sort of noise. I just... Izuku forces out without looking up, fiddling with his fingers anxiously. I like the color, and I thought... I thought you might, too. The cat is the exact same color as Obero's hair, that shade of blue that you don't see often, a beautiful shade of blue. The whole bin had been filled with strangely colored animals, a lime green dog, a purple elephant, a pink lion, a red rabbit, and a pale blue cat. And if that wasn't perfect enough, the glass eyes on the cat were so close to the green of Izuku's own eyes that it felt like fate to find such a gift. Something from both Izuku and Obero, for their friend and guardian. Honestly, even if it didn't have green eyes, Izuku still would have gotten it. He'd never seen a stuffed cat in such a color, but it really was cute. And he hopes that it would remind Shota of his lost friend, who's still very much a part of his life. And it had come from Obero as well. Shota might not know that, but Izuku does. I hope it's not weird, Izuku forces out, still without looking up. I don't know. I know it's childish, but I just... I saw it, and I... I thought of you... Shota still doesn't say anything, though he does draw in a shaky breath, I not looking up away from the cat. Izuku sort of wants the ground to split open and swallow him whole, anxiety only getting worse the longer Shota doesn't say anything. Um, Izuku smiles nervously as Shota stares down at the cat plushie. I, I just thought you'd like it, you know? I saw it, and, and nothing else really stood out, but when I saw that, I just, and well, well, um, you picked out my cat, and I loved it so much, and I just, it's just, it's cute? I'm sorry if... It is cute. Shota croaks out, eyes lifting from the green glass eyes on the cat stuffed toy. His fingers ruffle through the fine, soft fur, and Shota strokes one thumb over the feline's glass eyes, before tightening his hold on it almost desperately. It's so unique. Very blue. Looks just like... But with your... I love it, Izuku. It's adorable. Hisashi adds, voice soft and almost watery as he leans into Shota to inspect the toy closer. I love this color of blue. Shota lets out a soft laugh, thumbing at the cat's ear. Yeah, me too. Thank you, Izuku. Really, I love it. Izuku bows his head in embarrassment, reveling in the fact that Shota loves it. I told you it was perfect, Hobro chimes in with a squinty grin. I know that idiot better than anyone. You and me, pal, we're two of his soft spots. Put us together and mix a little bit of cat in for the cat lover and you've got the absolute perfect gift. Looks like Zuku wins the gift-giving contest. His Hoshi head leaned over Namuri, whispering loudly. I knew I should have gone for a rock again. Last time I listened to my mom. I don't know, Namuri snorts, stage whispering back. My gift was pretty risque. I'm sure your uncles will. If you finish that sentence with my kids at this table, I will stab you with this butter knife. Yeah, Namuri pouts dramatically, hands rising in surrender. Green Bean wins, definitely. They leave shortly after, Izuku and Shota being the last two to trail out the door. Everyone had grabbed some of Shota's presents to help carry out to the car, but Shota kept hold of the cat, Stuffy, and Izuku can't help but smile when he notices it. Obero is over saying goodbye to some of the cats, mainly Cloud, when Shota wraps Izuku in a half hug. Thank you, the man says quietly. It's so perfectly you, Izuku. I love it. And it reminds me of a friend, too, who I think could use more people thinking of him. It's one of the best gifts I've ever received. The man pauses, then grimaces lightly. Don't tell Hisashi I said that. I won't. Izuka smiles, returning the hug. Happy birthday, Shoda. I hope it wasn't as awful as you thought it was going to be. Brat. The man laughs lightly, finally pulling away. It's one of the best birthdays I've had in a while. Pride settles in Izuku's stomach as he squeezes his guardian a little tighter. Shota lets out a breathy laugh. Hey, what do you say we make more of an effort to come around here? I avoided this place for a while, but I remember how much I loved it now, with you and Zashi and Itoshi, especially if Cloud is back. He had some health problems for a while there, and he was taken off the floor. Izuku cocks his head in interest as to what Shota's going to say. Cloud is the white cat, isn't he? Yeah. Shota's lips quirk up faintly. You know... Obero, he adored Cloud, right from the second they met, after we lost him. It always feels like he was around whenever we'd come here, and Cloud always reminded me of him, too. Maybe that's why I stopped wanting to come around, but I think it's time to remember him, not mourn him. You're a lot like him, you know? There's a sentimental glint in Shota's eyes as he glances back at the white feline who's watching Obero, 
Izuku offers a crooked smile when Obro grins in their direction and waves wildly. Anyways, Shota huffs softly. Enough being sentimental. Now, we've got to head out before Hizashi comes in to drag us out. Let's go, problem child. Everyone's waiting. Obro joins Izuku at his side. What was that about? Izuku shakes his head slightly. Nothing much. Come on. Let's head out. Izuku doesn't see the stuffed toy again, not until the following Saturday, where he and Hitoshi head up to the apartment for dinner, with Shoda and Hizashi as usual. And there, on the shelf beside the photo of Obero, Shoda, and Hizashi, sits the blue stuffed cat, as well as a newly framed photo of Izuku and Shoda wearing those headbands. Warmth fills Izuku's chest as he makes his way to the chaos of the kitchen. Aha, uh -huh, right everyone, this concludes chapter 46 of UA Survival Guide. Chapter 47 will be next. I hope you all are still enjoying this fic, and as always, thank you so much for listening.